So uh, we went without. We went a couple of weeks without it. So uh, it's time to talk about Michael Bay again. Sounds good to me. Because <laughs> everybody loves Michael Bay. Uh, <laughs> especially when the news broke that he was doing the reboot of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Everybody was so happy. <laughs> I don't know if you remember the initial reaction to that, but, um... Well, people were up in arms, <laughs> to say the least. Um, and they were really up in arms about something specific that, um, I will get into later. Which they did something very interesting with. <laughs> um, but first of all, um... This, I, I, I wasn't sure, uh, how I was going to take this one. Uh, I have no idea. I've never, I should probably full disclosure real quick, um, I've never read one of their comics in my entire life. My recollection of the cartoon is really, really vague. I had like a bunch of VHSs of it and I watched them all the time, but right now my memory is so vague that I can't remember a thing really, except the opening theme. <laughs> yeah, everyone remembers the opening theme. And I grew up and watched the shit out of the three movies. Yeah. Um, especially the first one. The, the 1990 movie is like the end-all be-all of adaptations of the story, I think. Agree. Um, so that's all I had going into this one, was those three movies, basically. Uh, which obviously, infamously got worse and worse as they went. They're still, you know, like, you know, fun, guilty pleasure type shit. But that first one's really good, though, still, if you watch it today, actually. Um, this one... Uh, st well, it starts off and it's got like a um, an animated uh, opening that tells the whole story of what happened that we already know. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna be honest. I almost kind of fanboyed a little bit when I saw after the supposed rumors. I fanboyed a little bit when I saw the uh, TGRI ooze canister. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, I'm sure we didn't see it in 3D, which was. A choice. <laughs> so, um, that opening looked like it would have looked really good in 3D if you're going to see it that way. <laughs> you have that scene to look forward to. Yeah, I was told by somebody that it, it definitely works in 3D. So, um, it opens, and it's not Michael Bay. It's actually the guy, um, that made Battle Los Angeles, which, um, put a damper on a few people's parades. <laughs> yeah, just a bit. Um, because Battle Los Angeles is a total clusterfuck of an action movie. <laughs> Um, but it starts immediately, and immediate, not so much throughout the movie, but at the very start, that very first scene where a April's, like, on the dock and she's talking to that guy, um, it's got the shaky cam and it looks like a Michael Bay movie. Yeah. <laughs> um, only that scene, really, though, has the Michael Bay feel. Everything else kind of felt like its own thing. Um, and we're basically introduced to April or Neil as Bruce Nolan. <laughs> yeah. Um, she's wanted her whole life to be this big, giant, um, news person, but she's getting all the really crappy side stories that nobody wants. Uh, she's jumping on a trampoline instead of dealing with a giant-ass cookie, but it's the same, you know, dream-killing story. <laughs> yes. Um, until one day we're, um, we hear, obviously, about the, uh, the reign of the Foot Clan, who are run by the Shredder. Who, for a lot of the movie, is shrouded. The first half of the movie is shrouded in mystery, um, because there was some false advertising going into this movie. <laughs> no lie. Uh, but we'll also get to that a little in a little bit. But right now, um, as you, there are a lot of scenes in this that actually come right out of the original movie. Um, April witnesses a Foot Clan attack and sees um, Raphael fight them off. And she manages to get one quick picture of, like, his back as he's leaving. So she basically tries to convince her, um... What was Will Arnett? Exactly. <laughs> um, I want to say her cameraman, but I think his job might have been more important. I don't know. I couldn't really get... But regardless, um, he's got... She's got to prove it to him, and she's got to prove it to her boss, who is Whoopi Goldberg, who I totally forgot was in this until she showed up. Um, and she's hilarious in it, too. She's not there for very long, but, um, I really like the things that she had. Yeah, definitely. Um, long story short, eventually, while investigating, she comes across all four turtles. And I will say that, um, 
the appearance of the turtles in this movie is not something I don't think I think I can warm up to. <laughs> I think that's kind of one thing this movie really. Um, I, I won't say fucked up because they they didn't look like dreadful. They could have looked a lot worse. But you got used to it as it went on. Somewhat. This, and, um, this isn't the way I would have chosen for them to look. No. I heard a lot of people say, um, a lot of the fans complaining that the Ninja Turtles are supposed to, like, make children cheer and, like, you know, buy their merchandise and all that, but, um, these particular turtles in this movie might scare some children away. Yeah. <laughs> um, even if all their, that's one thing the movie did really, really well. All their personalities are intact. Like, perfectly. And they, they do have, like, little modern touches, like... Normally, I hate that shit. Like, you know, like, uh, modern references to, like, older stories. But, um, one of Michelangelo's character traits in this one is he's one of those ones that watches videos of cats playing the piano on YouTube. But I was able to immediately forgive that here because that is so definitely something Michelangelo would do. Yeah, no <laughs> lie. <clears throat> when they're all gathered around April and they're like interrogating her, like, what have you seen and what do you know? And Michael Andrews in the back saying, uh, hey, have you seen the video where the cat plays chopsticks with chopsticks? <laughs> <clears throat> so, uh, it's, I guess it's worth noting some of the voice cast. Um, I didn't recognize all of them, but we have... Uh, to my understanding, Johnny Knoxville was either... He was either cast, like, really last minute or the news that he was in it broke last minute. I don't know for sure. I am. I did not even hear a peep that he was involved in the movie at all. <laughs> so that was kept under wraps very well. Um, Noel Fisher was uh, Michelangelo, who was in. Um, he's the kid that blows up at the end of Final Destination too. He was. Um, he was in the Hatfields and McCoys miniseries, among many other things. Um, and the one you can tell immediately, Tony Shalhoub was Splinter. <laughs> With Danny Woodburn playing him. Was that like motion capture? I didn't know. That's that. exactly what it was. Um, yeah, because Danny Woodburn was cast as Splinter a long time ago, and I was thinking, well, that's interesting. Is he like... <laughs> oh, you really went there. <laughs> no, no. But regardless of that, um, let's talk about the uh, misinformation you probably heard in the news. Oh. Um, there was a big headline that came out, uh, while this was, like, in, on its way to post, pretty much, and it said, William Fickner to play the Shredder. Yeah, that would have been awesome. <laughs> and that was a, there was a big build-up to that. And yeah, William Fickner is a villain in this movie, um, but he's not the Shredder. Like, you, I was, like, I asked you afterwards, were you, like, waiting the whole time for, like, William Fickner to, like, turn into the Shredder in, like, an origin story kind of way? Yeah. But no, there's the Shredder and there's William Fickner's character. They are two separate people. And we don't even really see the guy that plays the Shredder. His face is mostly in the shadows until he's in the giant suit. It's basically the Silver Samurai suit from The Wolverine. Um... Yeah, Kevin Nash at the end of Secret of the Ooze. That wasn't the Super Shredder. This fucking guy is the Super Shredder. Yeah, no lie. Um, this Shredder is, like, really, really tricked out and has... He's basically entirely made of metal, and he's basically a giant-ass robot that just happens to do... He's Ironmonger with blades. Yeah. That's what he is. <laughs> um, only not quite that big. Um, and while watching this movie and seeing all these gigantic action scenes, um... I couldn't help but realize, like, I never really thought about this before, I guess because I've just seen them so many times. I've never really thought about the fact of how low-key the action scenes are in the other Turtles movies. Yeah, Because there's only, there's only so much you can do with guys in giant rubber suits. <laughs> um, the action scenes in this movie are actually really massive. Uh, there are two in particular. Obviously, um... It's a big budget movie. It's just a common thing now. New York gets destroyed at the end. <laughs> And there's this one action scene that really stands out. That's like really, really impressive. This scene is awesome. <laughs> um, they're in William Fickner's mansion, and they've just broken them out. There's a really funny scene where um, he's basically giving them gas. It's basically slowly shutting them down. So April's only option is to give them adrenaline. But the trouble is that she gives them the absolute maximum adrenaline they can withstand. So... <laughs> That has the outcome you think it does. Um, and then this action scene starts to happen. And William Fickner's mansion is on this giant, like, snowy mountain. And there is this big-ass, prolonged chase scene 
down the side of this snowy mountain that goes on for like six minutes. <laughs> and so many like things happen in this one little scene while they're all completely out of their control escalating down the side of this mountain. <laughs> been a great level for a video game. <laughs> Um, I think I've seen that level in a few video games, actually. Probably. Um, and it was hard as shit. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, and yeah, um, as far as the turtles, you know, living up to their personalities that we know them by, um, they stick to that perfectly. Oh, yeah. Even, maybe they, maybe sometimes they're a little too funny, if you get what I mean, but for the most part, they are, the, the way, okay. This actually might sound like an insult, but um, to me it's kind of like a guilty pleasure compliment. Kind of like a loose compliment. All right. Other people hearing this that know what I'm talking about will probably say, Oh my god, no. The turtles in this movie reminded me of the Rippers from Tangirl. <laughs> <laughs> Just the way they were with each other and their personalities and <laughs> the way they were the, like, the comedy relief and everything. Uh, that was the real vibe I was getting from that. <laughs> wow. Um, and yeah, sometimes, and they weren't, it's PG-13, they weren't afraid to be dark. Oh. This is, like, the, this is the highest rated, uh, Turtles movie there's ever been. Um, I think nowadays the original would be PG-13, but back then it was still PG. Um, and yeah, they're not afraid to be dark, like, um, they're all, it's for comedy, though. They're trying, to, they realize that April has seen them and has taken pictures of them, and they're trying to figure out what they should do. And you hear Michelangelo just say, Shh, we kill her. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're not afraid to use their weapons like they were after the first movie. Two and three really turned down the usage of their weapons. If you, I don't know if you noticed that. But, yeah. <laughs> um, apparently parents complain about the violence of the first movie. Um, Splinter's life is in danger in this movie. <laughs> um, there's the... And they've added... The, once again... Um, this is something that I totally would hate in any other movie, but there's just something about this movie, the way they handled it, where it just actually seemed to fit. Um, it might be a little awkward to some people that Michelangelo is really horny in this movie. Yeah, it's weird. Especially for April. One of his first lines when he sees April is, um, I think my shell is getting smaller or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he keeps asking her if she has any hot friends. <laughs> Um, and when I started to think about that, I was like, well, this is kind of weird. But then I started thinking, one thing that all the other source material of this movie doesn't really talk, well, you know, like I said, I've never read a comic book, maybe they touch on it, but, mm -hmm. um, one of the things that the these movies really seem to kind of not focus on of all the things in the title is the teenage part. I mean, yeah, they do, they, like, want to have fun, and they have, like, skateboards and all that. They say cowabunga, they do say cowabunga once. Yeah, that was pretty cool. <laughs> um, and they build up to it, too, like, what was that thing you used to say when we were kids? And he's like, I think, you know, I've got, <laughs> um, but yeah, if they're Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, they are probably pretty horny. <laughs> yeah, the hormones are going to be <laughs> racing, especially when they see someone like April O'Neil, who's probably one of the first women they've actually, actually seen. Yeah, let's, face. let's talk about this. Um... For starters, they changed the backstory a little bit. Yeah, just once, a tad. Once again, no idea if this is a comics thing. But um, I learned recently, by the way, that um, I complained in Guardians of the Galaxy how I thought the tape player was a uh, comics thing. Uh -huh. And it was just an excuse to get a soundtrack in. Nope, that was all James Gunn. So, my complaint still stands. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so, yes. Um, as far as what the other movies have told me, uh, they changed the backstory. Mm. Now, what everybody was so pissed off about... I remember this. Everybody was so angry because the story that broke out was that um, in this movie, the turtles were going to be aliens. Mm -hmm. um, and they put that to rest real quick. Number one, they make a joke about it because I think it's Will Arnett guesses that they might be aliens. And April just looks at him and says, no, that's stupid. <laughs> Like, I don't know if the aliens was a rejected idea, or if it was just something they threw in the press to confuse people, or... It's Michael Bay, it could go either way. <laughs> uh, after the reaction, they might have... they might That might have been their original plan, and then they scrapped it, if I had to guess. They made the right and, decision. And threw that line into police fans. Exactly. Uh, the story here is that the Turtles and Splinter were April's pets when she was little. Before they mutated. 
That's and that's not. Bad. It's a different take on it too. And it makes their their fast relationship to each other easier to buy. Yeah. Because in the first one, they became best friends like instantly after she passed out a couple of times. <laughs> Um, but here they, like, actually have, like, a history, and it makes sense that they become best friends really quick. Uh, because she already has an emotional attachment to them, even though they don't seem to remember her. Um, well, they do once they, they realize her name, but when they see her, they don't recognize her. And now we're on the subject of April. Let's talk about the fact that, um, this is new coming from me, but, Yeah, um, especially from me, too. <laughs> The casting got a really big backlash, yep. and I'm not getting on those people's cases because I was the same way. I saw the casting, I was like, "What in the fuck? This has to be a joke." Yep. Um, Megan Fox is really charming in this movie. <laughs> yeah, I um, said it yesterday's video, and I'm saying it today. She's got the yellow coat, and she's got you know the plucky personality, more personality than you saw in any of the Transformers movies combined. Um, and she's not doing the overly sexy thing like she was trying to do in Jennifer's body. Um, she really sells the plucky reporter thing really well. She's good at it. Um, and it actually makes me think, like, for the longest time before she was cast in this, I thought she was just going to disappear. I thought Passion Play had killed her. <laughs> but, um, Almost did. No, I'm sure people will, like, bash her on principle. But, um, I do really like her here, and it actually kind of makes me excited to see her in more movies now. Because she may have just been so limited to the material she had before. Because when they did Passion Play together, Mickey Rourke said something like, he was one, she was one of the most promising actresses he'd ever worked with. And everyone's like, he just wants laid by her. <laughs> but, I kind of, I, I mean, obviously not here, because once again, it's, you know, a Ninja Turtles movie, but I mean... This movie convinces me, like, if she had to do, like, some kind of big, heavy drama, I think she could probably do it if she had the right material. It's and the right And the right director to put her in the right direction. Um, there's a scene they play for comedy where she's trying to uh, convince Wolfie about their four overgrown turtles that I used to own as pets, <laughs> or the vigilantes, <laughs> um, and she gets fired for it. <laughs> Um, and you're like, oh my god, that's, kind of, that's like, really funny, because the, it's that thing where one minute she's trying to convince Whoopi that there's four over and turtles, and the next scene she's walking out with a box of her stuff, and you're like, huh, that's overplayed, but it's funny. But then we get a look at her, and she's crying. <laughs> and it's like, wow, this isn't funny anymore. <laughs> it's actually quite sad, because she's conveyed so much how this is, like, her dream job, and she's been getting shit on with it the whole time, when she actually gets fired, you actually feel for her. Yeah. Um, now that I've said all of this, you've probably seen lately that, um, I don't think this movie's getting a very good reaction from most people. No. As far as m I'm concerned, apparently this is basically this year's R.I.P.D. It's the movie everybody's gonna fucking hate, but I kind of like it. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty good. <clears throat> I mean, it's not like, it's not, it's not bad enough to be, you know, Hercules-level guilty pleasure stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's nothing great, but, you know, it's fine. It's got that comic booky style and dialogue mixed with, you know, today's and modern action movies uh, that the Marvel Universe kind of set up. But, you know, it's fine. What uh, Fickner is good, by the way. I didn't really talk about him except for the fact that he wasn't the Shredder. <laughs> uh, he's always got that good, you know, sinister thing he can do. Uh, he's, he's got some comic booky dialogue, too. Like, April comes to his mansion to visit him, and they're old friends, and he says, like, well, April came early this year. It's like, that's a really shitty line, but I can totally see it in the top corner of a uh, comic book. <laughs> <clears throat> so, yeah, you're probably going to hear a lot of bad things about it, but I think if people just see that Megan Fox is the star of it and see Michael Bay's name on it, they won't really think about it before they bash it. Uh, they'll basically go in ready... But, you know, and I'm not, I'm not criticizing, I do that sometimes, if the right names are attached to it, or the wrong names in, the, in that case, but, yeah, you know. Well, let, well, <laughs> let me explain from my perspective real quick before we go to the next film, but, um, as you know, and as some of our regular viewers here know, I don't like Megan Fox at all. As a matter of fact, I'll, I'll shoot, I don't care, I have referred to her as the man from time to time, <laughs> and that would get me a lot of backlash from everyone. She sure didn't look like that. No. <laughs> you see, the funny thing is, is when she's not trying to be a sex pot, she actually works. Like, her beauty actually works when she's better. 
Okay, it's it's the Snooky thing all over again. And when you see Snooky with her makeup on, and she's all gaudy and, like, all jerseyfied up, and it's just, she looks, like, horrid. But if you see her with her hair down and she looks like a normal person without much makeup or a little bit, it, it actually works. That's the same with Megan Fox. I have no opinion on Snooky whatsoever. <laughs> but I will say, and, another, and she's funny, too. Yeah, she actually is. <laughs> and I'm, so, like, I hate myself for, like, liking this so much. So, yeah. If you haven't, if you haven't seen the movie and you don't plan to see the movie and you hate Megan Fox, um... Listen to me. I'll, I liked it and I hate Megan Fox. I'll act as her ambassador. Get, if you give her a break, she can do that. <laughs> she's not Christian Stewart. She's not. People might think that, but she's not. Go so, out, have a good time. It's a really fun movie. And you'll want Pizza Hut afterwards. Because I know I do right now. <laughs> um, so yeah, they got the really big action. And it is really funny. Uh, there's one particular moment I liked in the middle of that uh, mountainside scene where... Um, this is Donatello finally gets... He, he actually says this, too. It's really interesting to see a Ninja Turtle actually say this. Donatello says, it's my turn to have my badass moment. Yeah. <laughs> um, and his badass moment is pretty badass, but they still make him true to his character. <laughs> because Donatello is the nerdy one. Yeah. He's they, got the spectacles and everything in this yeah, one. He's the Blue Ranger, basically. Yeah. In essence, he is. His badass scene is a truck is coming down on him. And he opens his, like... Um, I forget what he calls his weapon. But he opens it, and it flips the truck, because they're going downhill, it flips the truck completely over him, and then into a crash. The bow staff. And when it flips over him, it goes into slow-mo, and while he's having his badass moment, he's doing, like, this really nerdy laugh where he's, like, breathing heavily and snorting. <laughs> That's blown in the trailer, by the way. Of course it is. But I will say there's a lot of stuff here that is not in the trailer that you're not going to be familiarized with if you've watched the trailer several times. Because I know it's been on a lot of things for quite a while. So yeah, I know a lot of people probably won't just because it's in their nature, but um, I like dug this. I'd watch this again. <laughs> I was actually happy Raphael got to do some things in this one because usually he's the one that kind of gets beaten up all the time. He actually had a really awesome moment in the movie. Through most of the first movie, he's unconscious. Through most yep. of the second movie, he's kidnapped. <laughs> I really enjoyed his character in this movie because he's my personal favorite turtle for whatever reason. I mean, I wish he had the bow staff because obviously it's like a Singapore cane. So and, uh, there's always there's always a, it was cool. there's always a misconception that Raphael's the leader because he's always the one saying "fuck you guys, I'm gonna do my own thing." Um, they always make it make sure everybody knows that Leonardo's the leader. He's here. Wolverine. Yeah. <laughs> he really is. He's Wolverine. <laughs> so. um... Yeah. Well, we went on we went on longer than this than we normally do. Watch that on 3D next time, actually, because I want to see what it looks like in 3D. If you want to watch it again. Okay. Our second movie is uh, Into the Storm, which I really didn't know anything about going in. You just know the trailer is extremely loud. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, okay. Um, we open, and the opening is actually pretty, like you know, grabbing. Attention grabbing. Oh, yeah. Um, we got it. It looks like the camera work from Earth to Echo. <laughs> Completely. Um, but instead of a tiny little alien owl robot thing coming out of the sky, um, it's a big ass tornado that kills the three people we just met. <laughs> um, and we kind of start to see it from a first person point of view, which I thought was cool, but it cuts to black and shows the title before we get to see really anything of it. Which is nice because it kind of sets an aurora of uh, mystery. Um,. <laughs> it doesn't quite stick to its pro uh, promise of uh, anything effective, but um, we meet two different sets of people. Um, I'll start with the family. Um, Richard Armitage, I think is how you say his name, mm -hmm. the guy from The Hobbit, is a dad. He's one of those really stern dads. It's like, you know, we're leaving in five minutes and you've got to do this. And He's kind of like Daniel Stern at the beginning of Little Monsters. Um, <laughs> he reminds me of Dylan Baker. That's weird. Uh, uh, hopefully not Dylan Baker in happiness. No, no, no. <laughs> okay, so, um, Google it, you'll be shocked. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, um, and we meet the two main characters. I'm not sure who the older kid is. The younger kid is Nathan Kress from iCarly. I haven't watched that show in fucking years, but I recognize him immediately. <laughs> um, and they're brothers, and they've been assigned to do this thing. 
I thought it was just like a personal assignment, but apparently it's like this big giant thing that the entire town's involved in. Yeah. It's some kind of time capsule experiment where they're gonna go around with a camera so we can see everything from the camera's point of view conveniently. Of course. And they're basically trying to do a documentary time capsule type thing where they're gonna have all the young people in town talking about what they're gonna be doing in 25 years and then in 25 years they're gonna watch this video and see how it's changed but it's not just the young people they're talking to an old guy that's for sure gonna be long dead in 25 years but okay um and they interview like everybody no they don't interview everybody they interview everybody that's going to be in peril later in this movie yes <laughs> so anyway we met our second set of characters um, there are so many people in this movie I don't recognize. Um, I did recognize Matt Walsh, though. Yes. Um, he's kind of the... Okay, here's the thing. We get a double introduction here. We see these two things that look like Batman's tumbler before it's painted black. Yeah. Just rolling down the street. And we get this helpful label. Um, it tells us who they are, and then it says, um, Storm Chasers slash Documentary Filmmakers. And then we cut to Matt Walsh, and we see his name, and then he's labeled... Storm Chaser slash Documentary Filmmaker. <laughs> yeah. If you don't know his occupation in the first five minutes of this movie, you are illiterate, apparently. Uh, and also blind, because there's so many context clues around you. Um, and we get an introduction of every... It's shot like a documentary. Their name comes up in their occupation. But um, we don't really need occupations for the rest of everybody else, because they're all labeled as camera operators. So it's like, here's Matt Walsh, and here's all his camera crew. <laughs> That's all they needed to sell us, but no, every time they cut to somebody, we get their whole name. You know, because this is, you know, the extent of their character development. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Um, just like, for the kids, the same thing happens. Their name comes up, and it says, like, student at, um, whatever the fuck the name, the school name was. Um, I've forgotten already. We saw it, like, 20,000 times, and they said it 20,000 times. Yes. Not yeah. Silvertown, like, in Joe Dirt. <laughs> but Silverton. Um, and they're going to have a big graduation ceremony, and this is his job. This dad is so demanding, and needs every single aspect of life on camera, apparently. They need to do this time capsule thing, but then they also need to film, it's also their job to film the graduation ceremony. Because he's the vice principal. Uh, but then there's another thing about him and this girl that he likes, and they need to film something. Everybody in this movie needs to film something. And then, um, I'm Matt, with that. <laughs> Matt Walsh introduces us to his fucking tank. Yes. That he is made indestructible somehow. This is what he chases storms in, and this is what he wants to do. His big dream, the big thing that he wants his future to be, is he wants to be the first person in the history of the world to record inside the eye of a tornado. So he has built this indestructible ship with wheels. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And it's got, um... It's got tiny little cameras on every single angle of it. And then he's got this giant window thing that turns 360 degrees so you can get every single angle of it. And it's got this giant HD camera in it, so that can't miss anything. And then he has these gigantic bolt things that secure him to the ground so he won't be picked up by a tornado. Um, I'm not sure how you can test this sort of thing, but he seemed really confident. <laughs> so... You just have to let your mind at ease that that thing exists. <laughs> yeah, because it, it can just, save everyone. <laughs> well. Um, <laughs> and we keep hearing about this oncoming storm. They keep talking about, they're just going to, you know, they're not even going to take precaution. They're just going to have the graduation ceremony outdoors and hope nothing happens. <laughs> yeah, that always works well. <laughs> um... And the storm starts off, we see, they're watching the weather, so we see it's going to be this big, massive-ass thing, but they think it might go in one direction or another, and it might skip over them. Um, actually, they start in two different places. It's coming towards this town with the kids and the family in it, and the storm chasers are basically coming towards it. Um, and the storm starts, uh, just, just as it looks like it's gone a different direction, it starts. Um, and it's like really big-ass hail. Um, Golf ball size hail. Yes, and look, some of it looked even bigger than that. Yeah, um, like tennis ball size hail. Yeah, but then um, it starts to morph, and then there's a tornado, uh, like we saw at the beginning of the movie. Um, and then there's two tornadoes, and then there's three tornadoes, and then there's a shitload of tornadoes, 
And basically it's all coming down to eventually by the end of this movie, all of these tornadoes will come together and form one big ass one and kill the entire world. Yes. They said this tornado is so big it could get as far as LA is what they said. Um, which is like, you know, impossible. <laughs> so, um, that's basically the setup. Um, the problem is, um, it also tries to be, okay, it's basically Twister. Yeah, it is. Only with a bunch more Twisters. <laughs> and, um, the effects are a little more polished. Like, if you, if you look at Twister now, it's starting to look a little dated. Um... So this is basically just like a slightly polished version of the effects with Twister. And, and we're back in Oklahoma too with the Storm Chasers this time. Um, and now we meet all these characters. Um, now once again, you got you can't do a disaster movie without your four human elements. I think the human characters have the exact same characteristics in every single disaster movie ever. Probably. <laughs> There's just a tiny little wheel, like Wheel of Fortune, that they just turn, and those are the traits that the characters have. They have to choose from, like, four, <laughs> uh, depending on how many characters are in said movie. Uh, sometimes they just don't get any at all if they're small enough. <laughs> uh, one guy's backstory is simply that uh, he shouldn't have been there, and he wants to leave, and... Oh my god, it's so sad, because he was this close to walking away, and oh, he perishes. Spoiler, I guess. Yes. Now, that is one big problem with this movie, but first let me talk about the characters themselves some more. Um, we have this... Okay, they ha the kids have a dramatic backstory because their mom is dead. Yes. And they hated her before she died because she left them. Um, but now they're sad for hating her because she's dead now. <laughs> um, and we get his big solid story because he and this... Okay. Uh, this kind of goes with what I'm about to talk about. Um... The older kid and this girl spend the rest of the movie together because they go off to one place by themselves and they get stuck when the building collapses. The paper mill. And they, uh, their story turns into 127 hours. It's them talking into his camera about, Oh my god, I'm sorry, Dad, I'm sorry, Mom! Um, and they don't, they're not near as good actors as James Franco. In, in fact, they're not even, you know, should not even be called actors the way James Franco is. <laughs> yes. Um... So anyway, I'm sure they'll pop up in some teen slasher movie next year or something. But uh, yep. that'll, that'll be the rest of their career. <laughs> Guaranteed that happens. Uh, and then they'll disappear into, like, um, Burger Shacks or something. So, <laughs> anyway. Um, and then we meet this mom character. She's one of the storm chasers. And you basically see her plot point immediately. She's, the, she's got a lot to lose because she's got a daughter and she's a single mom. We know she's a single mom because she's staying with grandma. Uh -huh. I knew I knew, knew who that girl was. And here's the thing is, we get this immediately because it's like, um, she answers the phone and she's like, hello? And she's like, oh, I need to take this. Um, and then she leaves the van and she starts to talk and I was like, oh, is it like a, a secret boyfriend or something? And she starts to put on like a baby voice and I was like, oh, it's a child. And in my head, I swear to God, I said, now, the audience needs to know this. So when you're talking to her, you need to refer to yourself as mom in the third person so everybody gets it. She did it three times. Yep. <laughs> so. um, and that's the extent of her character. That's Lori from The Walking Dead, by the way. Yeah, that's right. I knew I, was, <laughs> I, knew I recognized her face, but I, I don't care about that show anymore, so it just went out of my head who she is. So, um, anyway... Um, we're introduced to two more characters. The crowd, this is a busy movie today. Yeah, very much so. And this crowd loved these two characters. Because they saw something in themselves in them. <laughs> Especially that dude sitting by me in the back. That dude was losing it. <laughs> um, I'm not surprised. There are two characters in this movie that are rednecks. And I mean rednecks. The first time we see them, he's trying to jump a four-wheeler over a flaming pool. Um, and for a while I thought the guy was Paul Ray. Thankfully he's not. Paul Ray's above this. It's he's Kyle, a, he's Kyle been, Davis. He's been in a fucking Coen Brothers movie. Who's that? Kyle Davis is from American Horror Story, actually. Mm, drawing a blank. But regardless... Never watched the show, so I wouldn't know. Um, and these two rednecks come in and out of the movie as comedy relief. They're basically Flea and Anthony Kiedis in the camera. You, the chase. I was getting ready to say that, you took it right out of my <laughs> mouth. Yeah, the other one is John Reap, actually, the comedian. 
who I actually find funny, but he was kind of so forced yes. here. This was one of those people. This, these are one of those characters where, in a disaster, maybe you have to kill somebody. <laughs> so as soon as these guys came on, I was like, oh man, are, are these guys going to die immediately, or are they going to tease us a little bit and then give us a grand finale of death? <laughs> um, I won't spoil it. But that is exactly what I want to talk about right now. Oh boy. <laughs> um, this movie is not interesting for a big reason. Number one, I don't give one single solitary flying horse fuck about any single one of them. I didn't care at all. If any of them would have died, I wouldn't have cared. There was one guy where I was like, I kind of like this guy. If something bad happens to him, I'll be a little sad. Um, tiny, tiny bits of that. Um, now here's the thing. The reason this movie does not work is there are no stakes whatsoever. Every single major character is indestructible. Oh, yeah. And there is no danger whatsoever. You have Matt Walsh and his team in an indestructible tank. He's got the sorts. Titus ready to fight. Yeah, that's what it was called. <laughs> yeah, it is. And then you have this family. Now, for starters, um... Maybe the dad's in a little bit of danger, but no, he's got to come to see the error of his ways and go, I'm not, I'm too tough. Um, and you can't kill the little brother. So you have the older brother and you have the girl. And here's when I knew this movie made this problem. They are in this building, and the bu the tornado comes through because they can't, they don't know what's going on because they're totally separate from everything else. Yeah. Um, the tornado has gone through the school and almost destroyed it. Nobody fucking dies. Uh, the tornado keeps coming. This is the biggest tornado in the history of the world, they tell us at the end of the movie. Two people die in this movie. <laughs> Fucking two! <laughs> no, people died in this movie, you just never saw it, because there's gotta be people in those houses that got major, taken out. Major characters. Yes, very true. Um, now, here's the problem. The time in this movie that you know there are no stakes and there is no risk whatsoever is these two major characters who have to fall in love are in this building together alone. The tornado comes through and wipes the building flat. <laughs> they should be done. Yeah. They should not even be... There should not even be a slight piece of matter of them left. But no, both of them are alive and well under the rubble, except, oh my god, my leg's caught. <laughs> I was like, okay, not one fucking person's gonna die in this movie. I can stop caring now like I was to begin with. <laughs> there was a tornado of fire, though. <laughs> yes. There is one kind of cool scene where somebody does die by way of tornado of fire. But by that point, it's too little too late. This is like an hour in. Yeah. You've um, pretty much given up on it by now. <laughs> yes. Um, and not to mention this style. Why did we have to do the throw? I mean, it's not like the shaky cam found footage thing, but still, why the first-person camera style? Because if anything, in a disaster movie, that's actually really limiting. Mm. Because, I mean, if it's a movie like Cloverfield, maybe you want to give it, like, a kind of, you know... Obviously, no, the thing about Cloverfield was nobody knew what the monster was. So yeah. the, the claustrophobic feel, um, and only seeing, like, the aftermath, is one thing. Yeah. But in a full-on disaster movie where you know tornadoes are ripping the shit out of everything, you kind of want to see on a grand scale. Um, and not through fucking Nick and Nathan Cress's camera. <laughs> um, so that immediately was a bad choice. Um, so yes, um... I found very little to like about this. Oh yeah, we also get the backstory. Everything is so convenient in this movie. Like, um, everything has to be... Well, first off, we get the convenient backstory of the girl. Like, um, we see the girl and she's being scolded by a teacher in the parking lot. This just happens to be the first time we see her. When this teacher's spouting her backstory at her. <laughs> yeah. And telling her she's in trouble. And Nathan Gress is standing all the way over here. And his camera can pick up everything. His camera picks up what they're saying from a distance at full fucking volume. <laughs> this is a powerful camera of microphones. Um, no wonder Matt Walsh is going to pay him $3,000 for that footage. Exactly. <laughs> um, and then there's this segment where they have, um, 
It's a disaster movie, so you have to have the disaster destroying things. So there's this scene where um, they're with the, they find the rednecks drunk and rather than practically kill themselves. And the tornado is coming down the street at them. Twister it, Madness. It's just, it's just strutting down the road, this tornado is. And you're like, well, the tornado's coming for him. This is gonna, you know, you know, fuck shit up and kill people. Finally kill these rednecks, please. Um, but then it starts to dissipate. And it's like, oh, okay. Um, and by the way, through this whole scene, there is a big-ass building right here. Okay? This building is perfectly safe, mind you. <laughs> so here's what happens. Just so the effects team has something to do, and so we have another money shot, um... The tornado's coming down the road at them, then stops, dissipates, and goes back up into the air, and then they're like, oh my god, it's moving! And then it sets itself right back down where it was, only right beside, just so they can blast through this building. <laughs> Nature is intentionally trying to destroy buildings. <laughs> yes. It just wants to take out this entire town. I think the town must have just pissed Nature off. It's like when you're a kid and you set all your toys up and play Godzilla with you as Godzilla, <laughs> is what Nature does in this movie. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so yes, um, that's what this movie is. Um, there is one big moment where they finally, finally, at the very end, they finally kill one of the major characters. Um, and that scene is kind of cool. And it shows that not everybody was indestructible, which is nice, but... You have this whole band of people. You have this whole array of people that we met while they were making the video. You can't make what you're trying to consider the world's biggest disaster movie and kill two goddamn people yeah. and expect people to feel like the characters are in peril. <laughs> but no, this audience seemed quite into it. Yeah. I but then again, they were on the redneck side, so... And there's a final uh, payoff for them at the end, too. So. Don't even bring that shit up. Oh, I'm sure people would want to see it. Okay. So. We're batting a thousand today, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. And we're going to continue. You can just take a nap now if you want to. He... And I some, did. <laughs> and another dude in the theater did. So you can too. But he was asleep a lot longer than I was, for <laughs> sure. You guys have a timestamp button or an X or a back button. Um, unfortunately, we don't. <laughs> yeah. We're watching this, so. Unfortunately, I have to sit here and just deal with it. So, um, our next movie is The Hundred Foot Journey, which is Lassie Houseroom, I think this is my, how you probably say his name? He did, like, The Cider House Rules, and Chocolate, and Hachi, and My Life as a Dog, and The Shipping News, and a whole bunch of other movies you probably saw that got a lot of critical acclaim. Maybe some not so much. Um, and he's got this movie on us. Oh, shit, I think he did Letters to Juliet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> So, he has now bestowed upon us The Hundred Foot Journey, which is advertised as a Helen Mirren movie about her restaurant. <laughs> yep. But it's not that. Nope. Um, it's about an Indian family. Um, if Helen Mirren wasn't in this movie, this movie would never in a million years have been a wide release. No, it's definitely into, it's got Indian movie written all over it. But, anyway... The actual main character of the movie... Actually, I don't know who the main character is. It's either the guy or his son. Um, it's his son, technically. Okay, well, we have his family. We have... His son's name is Hassan, I think. I yes. For, I forget what the dude's name is. We'll call him Dad. Um, and they live in India. Papa and is actually what his name is. And everything's great. Everything's wonderful. Um, and then there's a fire that takes out everything they had, including his mom. So they have to move from place to place now. Because they, they are literally homeless. Yeah. Um, eventually they end up in France. Uh, sure! <laughs> um, where they decide to, um, pitch their tent and open a restaurant. Uh, trouble is, is this restaurant is across the street from Helen Mirren's restaurant. And they basically duel. And that's not really what the movie is, though. It's basically, um, it's one of those food movies. It sets itself up to be one of those food movies, like, um, that's Feast, or, you know, most recently, Chef. Chef! Um, just those movies where you watch people make food and, uh, you're salivating. But, um... I was kind of sick in watching most of this, but then again, I don't eat anything. <laughs> but this isn't really, you know... God, how sick do you get looking at your eyelids? 
Oh, that's not right. So um, talking about those omelets, those disgusting looking. Uh, no, the omelets look fine. It's just um, this isn't exactly one of those movies. Um, it's more of a look at my wacky family movie. You know where um. You have the young boy who goes off and finds forbidden love, and you have the dad who is really eccentric and li has says nothing but funny lines and does funny things that people 60 years and older will find hilarious. So much so that they laugh themselves right into a nursing home. <laughs> it's, gr it's a Greek wedding without the comedy. It's a Greek wedding without a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Including the stuff that make Greek wedding good. Um, where the fuck's John Corbett? I don't know. <laughs> what is he doing right now? He was in, um, fuck it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't matter. Uh, we're 45 minutes in, I don't have time to go through John Corbett's <laughs> right now. As much as I would much prefer to talk about John Corbett movies than this. Same here. We must move on. <laughs> Let's progress. <laughs> um, now, here's the thing. Um, for this movie to really win you over, you have to be totally charmed by this family. But the trouble is, is this is pretty much, I feel like I've seen this movie so many times. And in fact, I have. Mm -hmm. Because I had you look up something after we, we left the 100 Foot Journey and we were sitting in it, waiting for End of the Storm to start. And I was sitting there, while watching the movie for like the first 45 minutes or so, I was thinking, you know what? For some reason, I'm getting a real East is East vibe from this movie. I don't know how many people saw that movie, but um, it was a really critically acclaimed movie basically about family from like 1999, I think. Um, and then it hit me why this was reminding me of East is East. <laughs> and I said, look it up on your phone just to be sure. Yeah, the dad is the fucking guy that's in East is East. <laughs> basically playing the same fucking character. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so there was that. Now, let's talk about the fact that this movie is basically advertised as um, Helen Mirren's movie. A lot of people are predicting she gets a Best Actress nomination right now. People who haven't seen the movie yet. Yeah. Um, Helen Mirren basically has a supporting role, and she's basically like the... Um, here's the thing. You have Academy Award winner Helen Mirren, okay? Um, and then you have her in this movie. In this movie, she's basically giving the exact same performance that Angelica Houston gave in Daddy Daycare. Ooh. She's playing that character. Yeah. With a restaurant instead of a fabulous daycare. <laughs> yeah. It's the exact same character with the exact same motives doing the exact same shit. <laughs> <clears throat> they even put kind of the same voice on. I kind of felt like Helen Mirren was doing an impression of Angelica Houston herself. <laughs> sometimes. Um... And this is this movie's idea of drama. A couple of dramatic things happen. This is after the mom is set on fire. <laughs> um, well, first off, you have the forbidden romance because she's a cook for Helen Mirren and he's, you know, of course, his dad's son. And they're competing. So, oh my god, I don't know what would have happened if they were found out. Like, oh, that restaurant is our enemy. Don't do that. You're a Capulet. <laughs> Basically. So, um, I got an idea. Let's kill ourselves. <laughs> if only this movie had We must poison life. each other's food. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, this movie's idea of drama. Number one, there was a scene where I felt like if we weren't in a theater that had so many people in it, I probably would have just succumbed to laughing my fucking ass off. <laughs> um, I it's worth, back a few times. <laughs> it's worth noting the score in this movie is by A.R. Rahman, who did the score... Most notably for Slumdog Millionaire. He won an Oscar for it. Yep. Won a couple of Oscars for it. Um, and this is the big dramatic scene in this movie. <laughs> okay? Um, so they have all their stuff, but the trouble is, is the ice is melting. And they might lose this stuff. For a restaurant, you know, that is pretty dramatic. Um, that's like a high, you know, risk. Factor. Yeah, of course. But... <laughs> um, we have really big, dooming action movie score. <laughs> yes. As this van pulls in really fast, and they're moving really quickly to get all the stuff out and get ice on it. And this score makes this scene fucking hilarious. <laughs> I thought I was watching a documentary about, like, whales and dolphins when I was doing this. Mm. 
And the score is really intense about it. Yes. Ice melting is the pinnacle of drama in this movie. <laughs> Word for Werner Herzog. <laughs> that was different. Now, the next one is, um... There's a scene where, um... Some of... <laughs> Some of Helen Mirren's cooks go rogue. <laughs> oh my god, this is funny. Okay, listen to this. We're talking about a movie from the director of Letters to Juliet making a movie about competing restaurants. And the rogue cooks set the goddamn building on fire with Molotov cocktails. Yes. Almost killing our lead character, Hassan. And what happens is he gets his, his leg catches fire and his hands catch fire. And he's not wearing gloves. I'm not talking about his sleeves. His fucking bare hands are on fire. You can see his skin on fire, too. It's just really obvious. And what does he do? He's a chef in a high-quality restaurant. Surely he knows what to do when his hands are on fire. Yes. <laughs> and what does he do? He stands up. His fucking leg's on fire. Don't forget about that. <laughs> um... His first instinct is to look at his hands that are giant fireballs on skin and just, like, what do I do? <laughs> he, he never, burns. He never, I don't know what they're teaching their kids in India, but never once did he even think to stop, drop, and roll. <laughs> he just ran around looking for shit to put his fire out. And of course he grabs hot water of all things. Whatever. And they have a few laughs, because for re most of the rest of the movie, he has to have his hands wrapped up. But they look like mitts. It's basically a nice bath that says, I'm a fucking idiot. <laughs> um, now, another thing. Um, this movie goes in a few directions. Uh, for starters, we have... Um, there's a really funny scene in this movie, but only if you know um, a certain cartoon. <laughs> um, there's... <laughs> There is a scene in this movie where Helen Mirren goes over to the... It's like when um, they got a Mondo burger and took it over to Good Burger to inspect it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> or when Kirk comes over to, like, um, basically degrade them. Helen Mirren comes over to their restaurant. <laughs> I so wanted her to burst through the doors like Kirk does and have his bodyguards there. <laughs> this ain't the most nauseating, pathetic hole I have ever seen. <laughs> We'll talk about Good Burger on this channel soon, don't worry. Well, fuck out of a journey, let's just keep quoting Good Burger. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We have to get back on track. <laughs> um, it's fun to get off track sometimes. Helen Mirren comes over to the restaurant, that's where I was. Yes. And um, he makes Helen Mirren this big meal. Um, and he says, no, he takes it over to her. Um, and he fuck the whole Good Burger thing. <laughs> he takes it over to her, and he's like, you know, here, I made this for you. And uh, she takes one bite of it, and she dumps it in the trash. And she's like, fuck that shit, get out of here, asshole. <laughs> I wish you would have said that. That's not real dialogue, in case you all were wondering. There's no way that's <laughs> real dialogue in this movie. Uh, I think it's only PG. Yeah. So he leaves defeated. And then we see Helen Mirren go outside and lay in the, uh, she kind of stands against the wall in the sunset. So the critics can say, well, at least it's well shot. <laughs> yeah. Um, and she's like, oh my god, that was amazing. You know what cartoon I'm talking about yet? Sounds familiar. Um, this is the, this is the episode of Spongebob called Just One Bite. Where Spongebob <laughs> tries hell or high water to get Squidward to try a Krabby Patty for the first time. That's right! And of course, Squidward's reaction is to say, I fucking hate it. And he buries it and makes it a tombstone. And then when Spongebob leaves, he digs it up out of the sand and eats it. And talks about how delicious it is and says, I gotta have more. And he becomes obsessed with it. That's awesome. That, the Spongebob episode, Just One Bite, is a scene in the 100 foot journey. <laughs> <clears throat> now, lastly, I'd like to talk about the fact that both me and the sleeping dude in the back, there was a dude throughout the movie you could, the whole theater could hear snoring. Yes. Because it's that kind of movie. It's that interesting. <laughs> um, it's not the guy's fault. <laughs> um, this is a movie... That has... Okay. The Hundred Foot Journey has an ending. Mm -hmm. um, basically, um, he goes to... After a while, Hassan goes to work for Helen Mirren. But then eventually, he goes to work for another restaurant. And he's going to get big and famous. Um, so he leaves and he goes and he does his own thing. 
And then Helen Mirren and um, East is East Dad. Papa. <laughs> um, start to have their, uh, they start to form a love story. Yeah, of sorts. Um, and we have a great ending shot. It's like the ending shot of Moonstruck. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, and the movie keeps going. And then, we do see Hassan get really big and famous. And he's on the cover of a magazine. And he's a really famous chef now. The movie keeps going. Yep. Hassan decides, you know what, I think I'm going to go back home. So he goes back home and he meets back up with the girl. And they can be together now. The fucking thing keeps going. And then, they go back, and they start to do this whole dinner thing. And they all come together for this big dinner. The family, Helen Maron, everybody is here for this dinner. Mm. This movie will not fucking stop. The only thing missing was the Howard Shore score. <clears throat> and, um, panning out and showing the map and then going back to the Shire. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, and then finally, a couple of endings later, the movie did finally end, but after a while I thought, like, a horrible joke was being played on us and we were going to be sitting in that theater forever. It felt like Like, forever. for the rest of our lives. And it was the longest was, movie today, too. And they were just going to keep showing us endings. <laughs> It's like, hey, that guy was really getting... I was trying to figure out who was going to leave first, me or that guy. <laughs> <clears throat> so, yes. But, yeah, some people there seem to be enjoying themselves. More power to you, I guess. Okay. So, if I can read all these notes, because there are a lot of them. <laughs> oh, boy. Our last theatrical release today is Step Ooh. Up All In. I'll bet for most of you, this is your first time learning there's a new Step Up movie out. <laughs> yeah. Because, uh, what was the last one called? Re uh, Revolution. Yeah. That seemed to just kind of come and go. Um, and nobody really... I don't think anybody has really talked about the Step Up movie since the first one was out. Um, look what you did, Channing Tatum. <laughs> You've created a monster and it won't die. Okay, so let's talk about Step Up All In. Obviously, you insisted on watching this in 3D because you're like, well, if anything, these movies have 3D dance sequences. That's all they've got going for them. They really do. That's so, all they have. Because they started being in 3D with the third one, of course, because they called it Step Up 3D. Which actually worked really well, their 3D does. So um, they're releasing one of these every two years. I think the first one was 2006, the next one was 2008, three was 2010. Revolution 2012, yeah, and this one's 2014. So, uh, 2016, um, is it Step Up Apocalypse? <laughs> Can't wait to find out. <laughs> the so, mob goes rogue. <laughs> so here's the thing. Um, everybody's auditioning for a commercial. There are a billion dancers in this one slummy area auditioning for this commercial. It's a bunch of commercials. There's toilet paper, there's hoses. These are weird-ass commercials, <laughs> thinking back. Um... And then you have one crew. You have this guy, I've already forgotten his name, but, um, he is our main character. Sean. Okay. And I didn't even look at that, that's bad. <laughs> Sean is our main character. Um, and he's got his little family crew with him. And they do their thing, they dance and they do all that. Um, for a reason I don't remember they break up. <laughs> Um, he goes one way, they go another. They couldn't book the gig, the the commercial you were talking about at the beginning. Yeah. So they well, go the, about, ways. about not booking the gig, um, there is a random confrontation, okay, because this movie absolutely must have reasons to have dance scenes in it. Yes. So, we are introduced to our antagonist, okay? I think he did get the gig, I think that's what starts all of us. That'd be correct. Okay. Well... This guy, I forgot his name too, even if he even got one, he may just be, hey, that douchebag with the hat. I know that doesn't narrow it down, but that actually that's, sounds every, right. that's every character in this movie. But anyway, um, so we have this confrontation between Sean and this antagonist guy. Um, and now, the antagonist guy has no reason to provoke Sean whatsoever, because he got the gig and Sean didn't. The end. They should have never seen each other again. Well, 
fate has other plans in store for these two. <laughs> um, antagonist guy comes to the bar to antagonize Sean. So Sean, of course, gets up in his face and says, Why don't we settle this on the dance floor? Of course. <laughs> No reason this should be happening. No reason this conversation at all should be happening. But whatever. It has to have dance scenes in it. That's this what it's for. This movie is almost two hours long. Yeah. So, this is what we're doing with our valuable time. They're fighting over the fact that this guy already fucking won. <laughs> so anyway, their crew breaks up. Um, I don't even remember where that dance battle ended up. <laughs> But anyway, um, and that's where we get our first dose of 3D shit. Yeah. Um, it's not enough that they just dance. He does the thing. He turns into Odd Job from Goldfinger and throws his bowler hat at us. Yeah. Um, and it makes like this giant warhead sound. <laughs> it's a fucking hat. Yeah. But anyway, um, and Odd Job's hat was lethal. His didn't even make a sound. But you know what? Whatever. Um. So yes. Um, and it's worth noting that um. I started to realize throughout this movie that, yeah, the 3D is only useful when it's dancing, I guess. When you take off the glasses, it's pretty much normal. Some scenes are blurry, but obviously, but for the most part, they look pretty, you know, normal 2D. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I started to notice something weird. I don't know how many movies this happens in now, but I got to, like, really notice it here. Um, I want to know what was up with uh, the 3D here as far as, like, where they put it. Because watching it the way I was, when I had the glasses off, when scenes that didn't have dance in them, I was, it felt like I was watching Spy Kids again. When they actually told you when to have your glasses on and when not to. Yeah, that was fun. When Mike Judge and Selma Hayek were telling you when to take them on and off. <laughs> it was like, oh, are they about to dance? Okay, let's check it out. <laughs> it's like, oh, they're done now? Fuck this. Um... There are scenes where they're not even doing anything. They're just standing around the little dance place. Yeah. Um, and obviously if it's really blurry, that usually means something's like really, really 3D happening right now. Correct. Well, there was one scene in particular that really stood out. They're just standing here in this room. And here's Sean. And Sean looks like he's in normal 2D. And then we cut to something else. And then we cut back to Sean responding to that. And he's really, really fucking blurry. I can't even see him. And then in the next shot, he's like 2D again. In that one shot, was he like really, 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 really fucking 3D to you for no damn reason for yes. a second? <laughs> that happened a few times, actually. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Alright. So, uh, they really want you to get your money's worth. Okay. So, um... And yes, um... The non-dancing scene, the dance, some of the dances scenes are pretty impressive, but, um, because that's what they put all their effort into. Um, the non-dancing scenes, the drama and the human, um, is basically just, um, it was like watching an Ed Wood movie get made. It was like, okay, one take, is that alright? We'll stick with it, that's all we need. This is a fucking dancing movie, that's what the people are here for. Yeah. <laughs> Um, your relationship issues, one take, we're done. <laughs> um, not that the relationship issues matter. And speaking of that, let's talk about our other main character. Because we kind of just abandoned Sean for a little bit. <laughs> yeah. It's like, um, it's like switching up the screen time of Ruffalo and Gyllenhaal and Zodiac. <laughs> it's like, hey, let's follow and get to know Sean. This sounds like a dig at Zodiac. It's not, I'm just using it as a funny example. Um, it's like, hey, let's talk about Sean. Let's get to know Sean. Sean's great. Sean's wonderful. Oh, this is Sean's drama. Oh, this is what Sean's going through. Oh, look, there's his best friend, Moose. Hey, Moose. Great. BFF Moose. Let's get to know Moose for a little bit. And then suddenly, for about 15 minutes, you realize you've only been watching Moose and Sean is gone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I didn't know who the main character was, but... Well, it's supposedly Sean, but... It's jumping we around a lot. We get to know an awful lot about fucking Moose. Here's Moose. This is Moose's introduction. We already know... I already knew his character as soon as I saw him. Okay? Because Sean's waiting outside waiting for him. And then we see him dance up. And this is what Moose looks like. Um, he's wearing shorts, but a sweatshirt. And he's dancing. 
and he's got shaggy hair. And I was thinking, number one, this character is supposed to be hilarious. Number two, this character will be the saint of the movie. This will be the character we have to worship the ground he fucking walks on. <laughs> Because he is so amazing and does nothing wrong whatsoever. Yep. And we have to feel so fucking sad when bad things happen to him. As soon as we saw him, I was like, oh my god, I think this character's gonna die. But then I remembered, oh yeah, this doesn't save the last dance. Ooh. Nobody's gonna die here. Nope. <laughs> so anyway. Um, yes. We suddenly start to focus on Moose. Um, now... <laughs> Okay. The second, the plot of this movie now. <laughs> um, There's a plot? <laughs> they auditioned, yeah. Somewhat. They auditioned for, it took me forever to realize, I guess the Vortex is some kind of reality show. On VH1. And, and that's <laughs> when I suddenly realized how much the logo for the Vortex looks like the logo for The Voice. <laughs> Took me a while to figure that out for some reason. I guess because my brain was that dead by this point after being introduced to Sean and Moose. Well, we started with one vortex and we ended the day with another one, so there you go. <laughs> so, uh, they auditioned for the vortex. You know the vortex is a big fucking deal because they send their audition tape in and then two weeks later, we know it's two weeks later, by the way, because Moose shows up to Sean's place and they're just hanging out and he's like, Hey man, we heard from the Vortex yet? Man, it's been two weeks since we sent that in. <laughs> and then, the dude that runs the place is just like, Oh, by the way, the Vortex sent this. Good thing you just asked. <laughs> and here's how you know the Vortex is a big deal, because when they open up the box, it's just a little white box. Just a tiny little white box, like when they ship jewelry to you when you order yeah. it online. Um, and they open it. And the contents of Marcellus Wallace's briefcase are inside it. Just a gold light shines on them. <clears throat> with, the main, with the main pop star that's in charge of it acting the best version of Elizabeth Banks in Hunger Games. Yes. Yep. <laughs> I wrote F.B. Trunk there. Did you watch me do that? No, I didn't. <laughs> I just got that immediately. That vibe just immediately there. Yes. So, um... Obviously, they have won the chance to be on the Vortex. Yes. So, they get on the bus, or the plane, or whatever the fuck, and they go to Vegas, because that's where it is. They got in the, the, the delivery van, remember? Oh yeah, they drive the fucking ice cream truck from the five-year engagement there. <laughs> um, that looks like it's been painted with fucking graffiti by the villains and the road warrior. <laughs> We're going all over the place this video, folks. I could have said Bellflowers to really fuck with people. That would have been awesome. I love that movie. Uh, no, fuck that movie. It's fucking weird. Um, I like it. <laughs> not in a good way either. But anyway, this movie has beginning credits. And in these beginning credits, I learned that this movie had a writer. You would have never guessed. My What I imagined the script for this movie looked like was a piece of loose leaf paper with, like, a pencil that just wrote down a list of cliches. Which is like, dude, uh, you need to hit these points and these points. I have done my job. Okay, so, their audition goes through. That's one. Uh, and they arrive in Vegas. And what happens is there's a whole bunch of different crews competing. And it's basically a reality show for uh, group dancing. Yeah. So, um, remember back when it was called Stepping in, like, 2006? Yeah, I do. <laughs> um, they don't really call it anything in this. They just do their thing. But here's the thing. They arrive on the scene. And all the crews are here that are going to be performing on the Vortex. And wouldn't you know it? Not only is Mr. Antagonist from the bar that got the gig in the first scene have his crew here... We have Sean's old crew here, too. And all of them are going to be battling for the top spot. And it was right at this time, I leaned over to you and said... What did I say? I said, well, we have three teams here that we have to care about. We have the good guys, we have the good guys' old friends, and we have the bad guys. 
Hufflepuffs. I was wondering who the fourth team they were going to throw away was. That was my way of thinking in the movie. Hufflepuff? Yes. <laughs> hey, hey, there's nothing wrong with Hufflepuff. So, um, I leaned to you and I said, hmm, I'm just going to take a wild guess here. I don't know anything. I know nothing. I'm seeing this movie for the first time. <laughs> but if I had to guess, I would say the first team to go is going to be the old friends. And what's going to happen is they're going to be there in the audience to cheer on the good guys while they face off against the bad guys. Didn't exactly happen that way. <laughs> um, if they had had a little bit of originality, like say, um, when Cal Naughton Jr. won the race at the end of Talladega Nights, <laughs> that'd be like if the, fr the old friends won here. Um, but I won't give anything away. <laughs> um, but no, that's not it. That's, we're not done with cliches here, okay? Um, we have the... Uh, where do I fucking start with the cliches? What? I guess gotta... I don't even think I wrote them all down, but let me... Let me try. Um, number one. We'll start with the love story, I guess. Okay. Okay? Number one. Um, we have... Mm. Okay, now, here's the thing. God damn it! I... <laughs> Okay, the love story. <laughs> of sorts. We have, oh my god, there's so many packed into this one cliche in itself. I got a cast list, we're good. <laughs> Hold on, we don't need a cast list. Fuck who they are, <laughs> it's what they do that's the problem. We have our two characters here. We have Sean and we have the girl that he's probably gonna like. And we know that they're gonna be, we know that they're gonna like each other because she thinks he's funny and charming because the first time she sees him he has underwear on his head. Oh my god, what a goofy, charming man. So, they start to work together, and wouldn't you know it, they can't stand each other. And she really, really can't stand him. But oh my god, she likes him, she tells her friend in secret. But what is it she likes about him? She doesn't know because he's such a brute. Ugh, I will never like him. Second. You're making Andy sound horrible. <laughs> there's a B here. There's a B to this one cliche. That was A. B is the fact that we have her sob story. And she's like, the reason that I'm so... The reason that I can't dance as much as I used to is because I, like, broke my ankle or popped it or something. And I'm so afraid that if I do that move, I'm gonna, like, pop it out of place again. And I just can't do that. I can't do it. I can't. I can't. I can't do that move. I absolutely can't do that move. I will never, ever, ever do that move again. Ever. Even if there's a big grand finale to this movie, where I have a big moment of, like, greatness, where it's like, all right, let's do the move. Even if I say that, don't let me do the move. Because I just can't do the move ever. Ever! I will never, ever do that move again! It's like Blades of Glory. <laughs> yeah, a scene that's already been fucking spoofed. They're treating us serious. <laughs> okay. Now, and yes, they do have a moment where they take a walk by themselves and have a big dance scene alone. But fuck it. Okay, let's go back to Moose. I'm sure you all missed him. <laughs> Here's the thing now. Moose? is head over heels in love with a girl. Before I talk about the fact that Moose is with a girl, let me talk about how unrelatable these characters are. Now, when you give them all these human elements, like, oh my god, you know, oh my god, that's sad, oh my god, that's such a sad story, that's such a sad build-up for this person, oh my god, I hope it pays off. Clearly, these characters are meant to be relatable in some way. Yeah, of course. Well, I don't understand it, because... Pretty much all of the women are like the really, really hot blondes or brunettes with like the shirts that cut off here, and they're in perfect shape. They got the ass and the yoga pants that is just like, you know, sculpted to perfection. And then you have the dudes that look like they spend every waking moment they weren't on camera for this movie at the goddamn gym. Yeah. Um, and they all look like that. The only person that people who don't go to the gym constantly have to relate to is fucking Moose. He still because, has something. Because, listen, listen, listen. Okay. Remember that sweatshirt I was talking about that Moose wears when we first see him? Yeah. Well, Moose is like, huh, I have shaggy hair and I wear, you know, sweatshirts with shorts and I dance around in my introduction because, you know, people are going to think I'm really great and saintly. 
Um, and I'm the relatable guy, because I'm like the wacky guy. If this were a full-on drama, I'd be the comedy relief. Yeah. Um, well, Moose goes home. Moose goes home, whips off his sweatshirt, has a really hot girlfriend, and of course he's wearing a tank top, and also looks like he's been to the gym quite a few times. Yeah. If you're a normal dude, fuck you, you don't exist. In this world, you really don't. Not even the people in the audience. I could tell that they didn't look like they were normal either. Now that I said that, Moose has this girlfriend he's head over heels in love with. When everybody's in Vegas going like, oh yeah, we're gonna party, we're gonna get into trouble. Moose is the one like on the phone with his girlfriend going, hi, I am being like, um, it's, uh, it's Schmoopsy from the, uh, Nazi soup ep <laughs> soup Nazi soup. Nazi soup. Schmoopy, yes. yes. Yeah, Schmoopsy is uh, Monster Sank. Schmoopy is Seinfeld. Yes. Got it! <laughs> Alexander yeah. Wentworth from A Living Dollar. <laughs> so, I don't remember that. Um, now, we're not done with cliches yet. We've got two more with Moose alone. <laughs> Number one, the misunderstanding. Here's what happens. Moose! Jesus fucking Christ. Is this movie kidding? Um, I forgot how much I hated this movie in between the time we saw it and now, because this was the first movie we You've saw. You've had time to reflect on it today, and that's I'm not just, good. I'm just not coming to terms with the shittiness of it. Okay, number one cliche that uh, Moose does is the misunderstanding, okay? He's his, girl his girlfriend's here, and he's here, and they're like, uh-huh, uh. but then he's like, hey, I gotta go to Vegas. You stay here, but I'll call you all the fucking time. He goes off to Vegas, and they're apart, and that's fine. Whatever. They're apart. However, one night, just one night, they go out and they do their thing. They do the, oh, we're drinking, ooh, we're dancing with other people thing, yeah, yeah. So he's with this blonde girl, and she's all over him. And he's getting drunk, and she kisses him. Yep. She, he's just standing there. He, he looks surprised by it, too. He's like, whoa. And he looked like he was getting ready to say, I have a girlfriend, should be doing this, sorry. Um, but she kisses him. So clearly this was seen. Yeah. So then he's like, whoa, I shouldn't be doing this. And just as he's about to say, I have a girlfriend, can't do this, he goes, and everybody... And there's his fucking girlfriend with luggage in her hand. I just got here. She didn't even say I did. She, she's there with her parents, and then she does the. She doesn't say the. Whoa! I totally just saw her force that kiss on you. You fuck off, bitch. You come here. I'm sorry that happened to you. You almost got like mouth raped. Um, no. She doesn't say anything. She does her <sighs> and runs away. They missed an opportunity. She just should have looked at her and just said, "What you doing?" Because she, of course, is Alison Stoner, who was Isabella on Phineas and Ferb. Now, she doesn't make this easy. No. She doesn't go back to the hotel and cry and throw her bags down. Because surely this is all paid for by now, right? She's Amy Adams the Muppets. <laughs> she goes right the fuck back home. Yeah. Right back home. And here's what... And Moose comes in. He's like, Moose has been with them the whole time. Moose has been doing this whole thing. And he comes in and he says, guys, he doesn't say, guys, my girlfriend's a bitch. She, she didn't even give me time to explain that that is not what happened. She just ran away and blamed me. And made me, and is trying to make me feel guilty by going all the way back after all this practice I've had. Not the dialogue at all. Nope. Guys, I'm sorry, but I gotta go. I gotta go get her, guys. I gotta go back home. So he goes back home, and he has to fight to win her heart. When he returns, it reminded me of the scene between Andrew Garfield and Brenda Song in The Social Network. I got that vibe. Um, only she didn't set his scarf on fire. <laughs> she could have. <laughs> um, no, they make up. She went through the trouble of going all the way back home. They make up fucking immediately. Do you know why they make up fucking immediately? I will tell you why. Because, wait, what else happened here? Um, there's the scene where he, uh, Sean has the drama with his old friends where like, man, you ditched us. And they're like, man, you don't, that's solved immediately too. So, they just accept it. After getting all, like, going through all that bullshit, they just immediately accept him again. It's like, oh, don't worry, man, we just need a conflict for a couple of minutes. Um, Make fun of his crying abilities. <laughs> now, listen to this shit. <laughs> listen to this. 
We are now at the final battle. Finally. And wouldn't you know, it's the good guys versus the bad guys. I don't know when the rest of the competition was happening, but it's now suddenly down to the good guys versus the bad guys. But wait! The movie's not two hours yet. We need one more piece of drama. Uh, turns out the show is rigged. Yep. And the main dude, that antagonist dude, is banging the F.E. Trinket wannabe. Yes, Jasper is his name. Um, and so they're gonna fix the votes. I don't know how you... Well, here's the start. Here's the start here. Um, it should be known immediately that these votes are rigged. Yeah. Because apparently, um, the Vortex does not know what a, a results show is. <laughs> nope. Because it's one of those shows that lets America vote. They bring that up a lot. Yeah. But when they let America vote, um, apparently they get results immediately. <laughs> We've immediately found out that That should have clued somebody in that the voting was rigged. Yeah, no lie. But, no, nobody talks about that. Um, but anyway, um, and then of course the big result at the end is just known immediately. Right after the competition, even though America voted. <laughs> what do you mean they've already voted? I haven't even got a chance to tally the scores yet. So yeah, there's a whole dramatic segment where that happens, and they're like, you know what, we're going to quit because it's a rig. We're not even going to do it. We're just, no. Just no. We're just not going to do it. There's no point. There's no point to do it at all. We're not going to be, there's not going to be a big climax of this movie. Just, credits! Bring up the credits now! They please! Start, please now! They just start manually cranking the credits. <laughs> <laughs> Old timey no. music in the background. <laughs> uh... But no, the lassie music for Man on the Moon. <laughs> Indeed. But no, but no, no. Um, we have to have our big climax, of course. Of course, because it's in the trailer. <laughs> now, if that's not enough, number one, we're all meeting in this area. Number one, this all happens in this little area. Are you ready? Um, all these cliches I've been talking about come to one fucking head. Yep. Um, Sean and the girl... Okay, let's do this. We're okay. We're in love. Awesome. We're not going to do the, you know, oh, we don't like each other now. No, we're full on liking each other now. This is great. This is fantastic. We're going to be together forever. What's this? Oh my god, it's your old crew. They're here to back us up and cheer us on. No fucking way. Moose and his girlfriend came back. <laughs> Just in time. And we're all in the same place here together. And when you know it, the contest is about to start in 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so much convenience. <laughs> oh, wow. I forgot how much convenience was around this. Okay. Uh, this movie also tries to be funny. Um, there's like, um, you know that scene that's in a lot of comedies now where um, a, char a character is eating? Um, the Ladies' Man and Funny Farm come to mind. I'm sure there's a billion others. Where a character is eating something that they don't know what it is, and they're talking about, oh my god, it's so delicious, oh my god, yes, I love this, I want more of it, what is it? And they, you know, they're, they're also just like giggling, going, hey, just eat it all, we'll you, and, you know, I'd stop eating immediately, but, uh, no, for the comedy sake, they have to keep going, and then finally, like, okay, what is it? It's always, you can bet anything, it's an animal's balls. Yep. That joke is in fucking Step Up. <laughs> I blame so, Fear Factor for this. <laughs> well, Funny Farm was long before that. Well, that's true. Um, now, here's my suggestion. Uh, the dancing can be cool. They do some cool things. Their audition video with, like, the weird laboratory thing. That, that was, was cool. awesome. Uh, the ending number is cool. Um, it's worth noting that um, I'm not positive, but I think there may have been a song that they danced to at the end. Um, that is a Gucci Mane song from the Spring Breaker soundtrack, and I can't say its title, especially on camera. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that song was in there, because I was like, oh my god, this song sounds familiar. Uh, and of course it went into instrumentals, so I was like, of course they're not going to say that in a Step Up movie. That may, I, may not, I may be mistaken, it may have just sounded a lot like it, but I could have sworn that that was the song. I'm working um, on finding it, don't worry. <laughs> but yes. Um, anyway, my suggestion... Since the dancing in this movie is, is, you know, good, since that's what they put all their effort into, yeah. um, why not just make a documentary about the actors you chose and their dance styles? Yeah. Because you don't have to hire a writer. You sure as you don't have to hire a writer that's just going to put forced m mandatory cliches to make some manufactured story around dancing. What's the fucking point? Why not just make... A documentary about the dancers that do this shit. 
Wouldn't that be so much more entertaining and less painful? Potentially. But no. Because nobody goes to see documentaries, that's probably what their problem is. So, yes, instead of that, we get this. Wonderful. At least when the DVDs come out, um, for those people that actually do that, um, you'll just have the skip button. It's like uh, the Freddy vs. Jason DVD has a jump to a kill special feature. That's brilliant, by the way. Um, they should have, like, jump to a dance. <laughs> no one would ever watch the movie. I'm just like, what's the point? Just watch the dancing. That's what you're here for. That's what the theater that we watched it with was there for. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, great snap perk and Rana, by the way, by the two brothers. I, was, I have to mention that. And the guy knows how to run the ropes, too. That was pretty cool. Okay, this should be a disaster because I'm about out of voice, and I still have to talk about Sharknado, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. I just want to go home. <laughs> <laughs> You're just tapping your wrist right now in your head, aren't you? We still have the fucking verses to do after this. Time, right? <laughs> the verses is going to be, like, five minutes long and, like, not satisfactory to anybody. <laughs> I hope that's not the case. Okay, let's talk about Sharknado 2. The second one, they call it. The tagline is Shark Happens. Oh, really? <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, when you go back about a year, you might see, you might have seen when I talk about the first one. And the fact that I don't buy into this shit. I am not the guy that waited until that night when it played on the sci-fi channel with a bag of popcorn with open arms going, Oh my god, I can't wait to be embraced by bad awesomeness. Um, I don't know. I think this is a trend that really, really needs to die, this. So bad it's good thing starts to break out, so everybody thinks they can do so bad it's good, and they try to be a cult favorite, and every single fucking time everybody fucking falls for it. Uh, and this is no exception. Um, and now I've gotten that out of the way, since I had to talk about it before, I'll just talk about the movie itself now. Okay? Um, so we start... And we're on a plane. And, haha, -ha, um, the first thing we see is the clouds and a uh, plane going through, but we only see, like, you know, the back of it going through the clouds. And it's like, oh yeah, a reference to Jaws. Oh, wait a minute. Airplane did this for comedic effect 30 to 40 fucking years ago! <laughs> but I think that's the point. Yeah. Because I will get to that in a minute. There is a cameo. Uh, but I will get to all the cameos in one long list in a minute, if you're interested. Um, for starters, on this plane we see the main guy, I think he was on... 90210? Yes. Okay. And Tara Reid, uh, who are back together now, because they were a strange, a strange ex-married couple in the first one. Um, the events of the last one have brought them together. Um, and now they're famous because he did all that in the first movie and she wrote a book about it. So he's a famous hero, and she's a famous author, and everything's great, and everything's wonderful. Uh, and suddenly, while they're on the plane, another Sharknado forms, and hell breaks loose immediately. Um, sharks break through the plane, they tear the plane apart, um, everybody's getting killed left and right. Um, and then there's a big moment where, um, a shark comes up and Tara Reid gets to have her big badass moment. So she pulls out a gun and she shoots at it. But before she can kill it, it bites her hand clean off. And when I say clean, I mean Tara Reid was holding some really thin pole that was much, much smaller than the size of her wrist with blood shooting out of it and screaming. <laughs> um, and my first immediate thought was, hmm... Our main character lost a hand. I'm not totally positive, but I'm kind of sensing a huge, gigantic, big-ass Evil Dead 2 ripoff in my future. Yeah. Uh, or since she's a girl playing at terror. Uh, but hand, since it's Evil, or evil Dead 2, since it's a hand. Um, I would pay anything, anything, to watch Tara Reid throw herself around a cabin breaking plates over her own head. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of people would. Um, so then the movie begins, and they're buying right in to the fact that they know everybody will fall in and love to anything they put into this movie. Um, the Sharknado concept has a theme song now. Oh no. It plays twice. It plays over the beginning credits, and it plays when they're 
They're doing their big badass gathering their weapons montage. So, continuing, um, we cut forward and Tara Reid's in the hospital. Um, so basically the movie is trying to basically put her away so we don't have to watch her act. Um, there's a particular scene where she kind of wakes up from her little brief coma. Um, when it comes to being asleep and then waking up, Tara reproofs that she cannot even act doing that. <laughs> um, you, you just have to see it. <laughs> you just have to see Tara Reid wake up from a brief coma and see how it looks. Oh my god. So anyway, um, we're introduced to new characters. Um, we're introduced to Mark McGrath. <laughs> nice. <laughs> looking more like Ethan Hawke, looking like Ethan Hawke more than ever now. <laughs> Um, and his, um, he's dating the main character's, uh, Finn is his name, how can I fucking forget that? It's because he's just a pun all the goddamn time. He's dating Finn's sister, and her kid is there, um, and they're just hanging out in New York. It takes place in New York. It's, we're in a big city now. Oh. Uh, so much New York getting destroyed this week. Yeah. So, um, regardless, um, uh, these are our characters, and... The main reason it's set in New York is so we can destroy the attractions. It's trying to be Roland Denmark by way of Sharnado. Um, but the problem here is we get to know these characters, but um, the movie wastes a lot of time, wastes a lot of time introducing characters just so they can be killed. I know it's for comedic effect, but in order to do something for a comedic effect, you kind of have to have the comedy factor too. That's kind of not here. Um, and they go completely off the rails, like, I mean, not in the way they want. Um, for starters, um, remember the scene in Cloverfield? Mm -hmm. um, well, we do have the scene where they take out the Statue of Liberty's head, and it rolls around New York like it's the boulder from Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, so people die like that. It's like the Ferris wheel in the first movie, I guess. Um, and then you have, um, a dude gets killed by a fucking alligator. Not as over the top as you might want or hope or think it sounds. Um, like there's, we meet some guys in the sewer that are just there to die, and then we meet uh, some trash guys, and we get like their whole backstories too, and they're just there to die. Um, and it, honest, I know it's supposed to be funny or whatever, but it just feels like a fucking waste of time because this movie already feel, this movie is already a waste of time. You don't really need to add characters that are just there to die. You can just have them there and kill them. That's all people want to see anyway. But whatever. Um, and then, of, of, also, obviously, because of the setting, it has a lot of that New York humor. Like, oh, because it's in New York, the Sharknadoes are tougher. And, oh, even though there's a Sharknado, the cab driver won't move. And, oh, the, um, they just do the whole, um, do you remember that stupid, stupid, stupid scene in Raimi's first Spider-Man movie? When they all start throwing garbage at the Green Goblin, and the guy says, uh, We're New Yorkers, you mess with one of us, you mess with all of us. Yeah. That scene's kind of in this movie a few times. <laughs> That's basically the whole attitude of the movie. Um, now, I guess now I can go into all the cameos. Because uh, there's a lot of them. Because that's basically what this movie's whole gimmick is. Is, oh, we'll get people excited because they have familiar faces in them. Because we have nothing else to fucking offer whatsoever. Um, Kelly Osborne is, is the flight attendant in the first scene. Um, she loses her head. Um, another victim of the plane is Will Wheaton, <laughs> who I don't even think has a line. He is just there to die. And I think that was his wife there with him. Yes. Um, once again, I was talking about the fact that I'm pretty sure the airplane reference was probably intentional because, wouldn't you know it, the pilot is played by Robert Hayes. <laughs> yep. Um, and of course they had to throw in the little joke where they say, um, they're asking him what he's gonna eat, and he says, well, I'm having the chicken, I was gonna have the fish, but... Uh. Um, so there's all those. Then we have, um, Andy Dick is there as a cop for about ten seconds. Um, you're not cheating and looking at these, are you? Um... Somewhat. <laughs> we have Sorry. the only cameo I cared for... Um, because they really, really sell it, was, um, Matt Lauer and Al Roker play themselves, mm. um, on the show. <laughs> um, and they have a really nice banter, too, like, Roker is really, really into it. Like, Roker's, like, saying, we're getting so many Sharknados, and there's Sharknados here, and there's Sharknados there, there's Sharknados everywhere, and Matt Lauer's just like, yes, well, um, 
So, yes, these shark storms seem to be coming. Both. No, Matt! Sharknadoes! <laughs> I love, the, I, love, guy. I love the fact that Matt Lauer is basically me in this situation. Uh, I'm not fucking saying that. It's Shark Storm. <laughs> well, Roger did do Bill and Ted in 2012 at Universal, so, I mean, he obviously has a sense of humor. Like, they're the ones in it that, like, just really sell what they're doing. Like, they really go for it. So, that was fun to watch them. Uh, Kelly and Michael are there, too, as themselves, and they get to do their own thing. Michael gets taken out, of course. I saw Gellman was in there, too. Huh? Gellman. Going from the same show. Oh, yeah. From live. Um, Lori Hibbard's husband. <laughs> and we're getting more and more random here. Um, Tara, Tara Reed's doctor is Billy Ray Cyrus, who I didn't recognize because really? he's got a beard and he's wearing like the the scrubs. Mm. So without his hair, I didn't recognize him at first. He was on um, a short-lived series called Doc, so I I think that was done on purpose too. Well, speaking of little references to TV shows... Yes, I know where you're going with this. Um, it's not even really a cameo. It's actually a pretty major part, but I think it counts as a cameo. Judd Hirsch plays a taxi driver. Yeah, he does. Um, and then we have Richard Kind. Goodbye. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, he does. <laughs> um, Richard Kind plays a former baseball player, and he's there in the stadium with them. Um, and he's just another character. Now, this fucking subway scene, there's two random-ass cameos. Um, number one is Perez Hilton. I'm guessing it's simply, like, a self-deprecating humor to where, like, a lot of people wouldn't mind seeing Perez Hilton being killed by sharks, I guess. <laughs> well, we'll go with that. Especially celebrities. <laughs> and then we're getting a little desperate. We're getting really, really desperate on the cameo scale here. Um, because they're in a subway, sitting on a bench, with a big subway sign behind him, eating fucking subway, is Jared. The Jared from Subway, the Subway Diet Guy. Has a cameo in this movie just because. And then, from then on, there's Subway product placement everywhere. <laughs> Um, Judah Freelander's there as one of their friends. I didn't recognize him either because he's not wearing his glasses. Hmm. Um, and lastly, the cameo I figured you would notice the most. <laughs> I didn't know if you knew about it yet or not. No, I did not know about it. Um, the main guy, he's, I guess he's with the fire department. I couldn't quite tell. That's what it says on here. Kurt Angle. <laughs> so funny, too. This is the second shitty low-budget horror movie I've seen Kurt Angle in in the span of two weeks. He's got another one, too, but it was straight to video. Oh, my God. At least we reviewed Pain and Gain recently. It makes him doesn't, look, doesn't make him look too bad. Yes. Okay. Now, this, as I've talked about many times before, my big problem with this movie is how it is simply... It's an idea. It's not a goddamn movie at all. It's this cheap-ass idea that they knew will get attention and people will love because it's a brief fad. You're supposed to think it's really cool and over the top and like just, oh my god, that's so insane and so stupid, but I love it anyway. That's the attitude you're supposed to have. Like the scene where, um, Richard Kind, like I said, is a former baseball player and there's one scene where he, um, a shark comes down at him, he picks up a big-ass bat, and he bats the shark into the scoreboard. We're supposed to think that's badass and over the top. Um, there's a scene where um, Finn is in a pizzeria, and a shark, a small shark, comes through the roof, and he hits the shark, and the pizzeria guy opens the oven, and it flies in there, and he shuts it, and that's how they kill it. We're supposed to think that's cool and over the top and stupid, but great. Um... But the, it just stops it stupid and isn't great. It's not even stupid. It wants to be stupid. It's just fucking a waste of time. That's all this movie is. Okay? They want it to be, like, really funny, too. But, like, in that, oh my god, you're laughing, but it's so stupid. But it's, like, on purpose, so that makes it great. That thing. Um, I don't... Where's the great? Where's the... I just... I watched this alone, thank Christ, but I was just imagining watching this with somebody. Just anybody. And the person kind of saying, yeah, it is stupid, it's dumb, and 
you know, one over-the-top thing happens, and they're like, all right, it's stupid, but you gotta admit, that was awesome! No, I would never admit that about anything that's in this movie. Because that's exactly what they want. They are just buying right into what they know people will just take on face value and love. That's all they're doing. <clears throat> and there's this, and they always, they always try to make, it always, and sometimes it tries to even be more than that. Like, they... Every time a character comes up with something ridiculous, like, hey, let's put, like, gas in, like, water guns and set them on fire, and, like, almost every ten minutes, every time somebody comes up with an idea, there's another character there to tell them how smart they are. Which, if you think about it, is a very self-congratulatory thing for a writer to do. Yeah. Um, but no, everything one character does, another thinks is fucking brilliant. So, you have to deal with that. Then they do all those big, like, big badass things. Like, there's a scene where they unsheath a sword in slow-mo, and they slice them in half as they come out of the sky. Um, they're building up... Obviously, the big thing in the first one was Finn took a chainsaw and, you know, cut himself out of a shark. So they build that up the whole time. Finn's like, I need my chainsaw. I gotta get my chainsaw. It's like in the rundown... When uh, Dwayne Johnson says, don't give me guns, I don't do guns, I don't do guns at all. And they're building it up for him to have a gun at the end of the movie and he fucking tears the place apart. Which is badass in that movie. But here they're just building up the whole time. It's Finn saying, I gotta have my chainsaw, I need my chainsaw. And oh my god, he gets his chainsaw at the end and it's really badass! It's a huge payoff! This dumb piece of shit movie. And then, yes, Tara Reid does come back at the end. And she may or may not have made a slightly, a slight different change to her hand. But here's the problem. I didn't see it as an ode to Evil Dead 2. I didn't see it as an ode to Planet Terror. The way this scene plays out, it's like they're trying to play it off as their own badass thing that they came up with. Because they make it really, really dramatic. Like, it's not even supposed to be like, oh my god, that's so stupid. They actually want you to say, oh my god, that is awesome. That's what they want. But... I can't do it. I can't do it with this movie. And of course, there's a scene. I even saw, before I even watched that, I saw somebody talking about this. Because this is exactly what they want. This is what happens here. There is a scene where they try to do the thing they did in the first one where they blow up the tornado. Mm -hmm. But this time it makes the sharks catch on fire. And then you have flaming sharks killing everybody. Um, what happened here is. This got, one of the things I saw was somebody saying, like, oh my god, you have to see this to believe it. The fucking sharks are on fire in all capital letters. But here's the problem. When this writer and the director are sitting in a room trying to come up with this stuff, they are predicting your every goddamn move. Mm -hmm. They are sitting in some room saying, I've got an idea. We'll make the sharks catch on fire. Because then they'll tell all their friends, you have to see this, the sharks are on fire this time. And every fucking time people buy right into it. It's just like, it's like the end of Babe. Just, please, come this way, sheep. Come this way. <laughs> you just go right in there and do your thing. I will direct you right in the direction I need you to go. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's it. That's all these movies are. And people fall for it every time. And it's really, really, really fucking old. And really played out. It only exists so that fucking, like, college kids can, like, get drunk and just laugh and be fucking rowdy. <laughs> That's what this movie is for, really. Um, so, yeah. They know exactly what they're doing, and they know exactly how you're going to react to it. And they play off your predict your predictability as a movie watcher and what you react to. And it's a horrible thing that they get away with, I think. People seem to enjoy it, though. And lastly, I guess this is a New York thing. There's a big scene after the end credits. You ready for the big end credits scene? Go ahead. It's Finn eating a piece of pizza. Nothing happens. Finn eats the piece of pizza and we fade out. <laughs> it's like the shawarma in Avengers? Probably that's what it's trying for. Yeah, it's even in fucking New York. So, I don't even want to give this, I don't even want to give this movie this much attention anymore. There's one more, for sure. <laughs>
I didn't want to do the first one, remember? I know. Now we have to do them all because we've done the first one. Whatever. <laughs> Our last movie is a movie I think is almost out on DVD now. That's called Fading Jiggler. That's a movie that's written, directed by, and starring John Turturro. Um, who's not a not a bad writer-director. He did a movie called Romance and Cigarettes with James Gandolfini and K. Winslet. That wasn't bad. Uh, Bobby Cannavale was in it, too. Um, but he stars in this one. Um, he and Woody Allen work in this bookstore. And the bookstore is closing because books are becoming obsolete, basically. Yes. It sounds like the start of a future movie, but it's a fucking gigolo movie. <laughs> um, now... And, of course, we kind of get to know their little back and forth. They're best friends, you know. Um, Woody Allen's basically known him his whole life. Like he said, um, they're packing up, and he's like, I've known you since you were a little kid when you broke into this bookstore and tried to rob it. And, you know. <laughs> um, and then finally, Woody Allen gets an idea of how to make money. Because he's like, you know, you're older, and you're good-looking. You know, you can tell Tatura about it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, um, he says, I've got a friend who wants to explore the possibility of a three-way. She just wants to explore her sexual freedom. And she doesn't have anybody to do it with. And I thought maybe, um, you'd want to, and she would pay us. So long story short, John Turturro becomes a gigolo, and Woody Allen is his pimp. <laughs> That's what this movie is. Um... Now, it cannot be ignored how self-fulfilling self this role is. Do you know who the three-way in this movie is building up to be with? Sharon Stone and Sofia Vergara. <laughs> hmm. And, um, and Sharon Stone looks really good lately. Uh, there was a time there, like when Basic Instinct 2 came out, where I was like, oh my fucking god, what happened? <laughs> but uh, she's starting to look good again. <laughs> That's good. And Sofia Vergara is relentlessly sexy in this movie. <laughs> um, and John Turturro wrote and directed the movie himself to star as a guy that the whole movie is building up to having a three-way with them. <laughs> Go figure. Now, um, we kind of split up into two movies from here. We follow Turturro as his own thing, we follow Woody Allen's own thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Tortura's thing is basically the Jiggle thing. That's just what his character does. Uh, the Woody Allen character is a lot more interesting, because he's really funny here. And, um, you can tell, uh, Tortura obviously took, like, a lot of inspiration from him. So it's basically, like, Woody Allen being in one of his own movies. He's just not the writer-director this time. But he basically plays the character the exact same way, but it works here, the way the character's written. Um, it was worth noting that, um, recently Woody Allen got accused of being racist because all his casts involve white people, lately. Um, in this movie, his wife and his children are all black. <laughs> and it's not even brought up, it's not even a plot point, it just kind of is what it is. And that's interesting, especially since that just happened to break out. Uh, that little complaint. Um, now, here's the thing. Um, there's a third person brought into this movie, a third girl. Uh, Vanessa Paradis, I think is how you say her name. Um, she is, um, there's a subplot where Woody Allen's kids get lice. So he takes them to her, um, because she's, like, she's able to dill-house them, that's what she does. Um, and she's a widow, and she's heartbroken. Um, and she has a neighborhood watch cop always watching her. The neighborhood watch cop is Leif Schreiber. Um... And because he, like, you know, has loved her, like, um, forever, because they grew up together, um, he's just always keeping on her and starts to realize something fishy is going on when Woody Allen and Dr. are always hanging out. Um, now the problem is that, um, with this character, this new character, um, a love story blossoms. And the trouble is, is we don't really, her character is more or less like a blank slate. She has one scene where she breaks down and cries, but apart from that, especially in the love story scenes where it's first, their love story is supposed to be like blossoming into something, there's nothing there at all. But we're supposed to buy it anyway. I don't know. Um, and then there's another subplot where um, 
there, the first plot is Tortoro and how it's all leading up to this three-way. The second plot is what exactly is happening with Leo Schreiber following Woody Allen around. Somehow, this movie ends up with him escorting Woody Allen to a Jewish court or something. And they put him on, like, a little trial. I don't know what the fuck this movie is doing. Long story short, I don't know where it's where it thinks it was going or what it was doing. And it's like he was just kind of like, he just had no idea the next day where it was gonna go, and he just ended up in like bumfuck land or whatever. This movie had no idea what it was doing, um, and it's just, and like I said, the way Tortura plays the character, it's really hard to buy that women would fall on all over him. I'm not saying Tortura's like a bad looking guy or anything. I'm not saying either way. <laughs> But, um, I don't think he's the kind of guy that could very easily score a three-way with Sharon Stone and Sofia Vergara. Especially since we're supposed to buy that Sofia Vergara and Sharon Stone are having trouble finding people to be in a three-way with them. Wow. I'm not sure that would be the case. I'm talking about suspending disbelief right there. Um, and for the most, like I said, the Woody Allen scenes can be funny because his character's funny and he plays it really well. But the Tortura stuff, which is kind of the main focus... I think it's supposed to be, like, really steamy and sexy and a bit erotic, but it just comes off, like, kind of, like, sleazy and a little unbelievable, and there's no sexual chemistry here whatsoever. <laughs> um, so all in all, this movie didn't work. So, that's... That's all there is to say. It's a really small movie, and it really doesn't make its point. It has really not much to offer. It's a shame. And since a lot of people like are against Woody Allen now, uh, there's not many people I can recommend it to, because Woody Allen's the best thing about it. <laughs> hmm. Unless you just like looking at Sofia Vergara, because she's really, really nice looking in this movie. <laughs> really, really, like, more so than ever, and that's saying something about her. <laughs> oh, boy. <clears throat> so that's it here. All right. As always, we're going to run down the movies and one last time, real quick. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I would. And I think people are going to hate it, but I like it just yeah. fine. <laughs> End of the storm. No. <laughs> Root foot journey. No. Step up all in. No. Sharknado two. You'd be doing me a favor if you didn't. And fading gigolo. No. Nah. Wow, we had one bright spot in this video. Next week! Next week, actually, I'm going to surprise you guys. We're going to have two videos next week. We're going to be talking about Let's Be Cops and The Giver. We're also going to be talking about The Expendables 3. And there are some other limited releases coming as well. I don't know if you know what they are. Top that, so we'll figure this out later. So, this is Saturday, so tomorrow, catch the new verses that AJ is so happy to be shooting afterwards, and uh, Cryptic Commons choreography, so check that out. Wrestling content Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and of course, also, next week, Halloween Horror Nights Reveal Week, so I'll do those videos too. So, AJ, any parting words? <laughs>